All Petrov had to do was get on the trolley bus, and all manner of loonies would immediately begin to pester him. There was just one who tended to keep to himself, a quiet, pudgy, clean-shaven old man who had the air of an aggrieved child. Whenever Petrov came across this old man, he felt moved to get up from his seat and aggrieve the old man even more. That's just the kind of wild, inexplicable feeling that would overcome him, a dense convergence of some primal Darwinian force and Dostoevsky and pettiness. The old man, sensing that he was being watched, would timidly turn away. This little old man was a perennial loony, so to speak. Petrov had been running into him almost since childhood, even outside of public transportation. But the other lunatics intruded upon Petrov's life on a one-time basis, as if they had escaped the eighth kilometer along the Siberian route and rushed to trolleybus number three for the sole purpose of chewing Petrov out, only to then disappear forever. There was the little old lady who had given up her seat to Petrov on the grounds that he, Petrov, was an invalid with wooden arms and legs and cancer. The cancer not being wooden, just cancer. There was the burly man who had looked like a blacksmith out of a Soviet movie, that is, uh, a giant with a bellow that seemed to make the trolley's metal frame rattle, similar to how a half-empty bottle vibrates when a truck thunders by. Squeezing Petrov against the trolley's wall with his left flank, this man recited his poetry to the elderly conductor lady because apparently, underneath the parka that smelled of metallic shavings, gasoline, and diesel, there lurked the tender heart of a poet. Yet the years fly by, like birds do our years fly by, intoned the burly man, infusing years and birds with particular tenderness. The conductor lady listened, smiling meekly. Oftentimes, folks who weren't, weren't even elderly enough to be suspected of harboring Marxist sympathies would sidle up to Petrov and proceed to spew some nonsense about the golden age of the party, about annual vouchers to Soviet-era resorts, and about how everyone currently in power needed to be lined up against a wall and shot. Whenever one of the loonies mentioned this infamous wall, Petrov, for some reason, would imagine Putin and the Siberian governor, Rossel, standing around awaiting their execution. In his mind, he pictured them exactly as they appeared on his TV screen. Russell smiling happily, and Putin serious, but with a glint of irony in his eyes. One time, two pensioners had almost come to fisticuffs right in front of Petrov. They had both been making the same arguments, and their political platforms were not so different, but still they argued. Petrov had actually begun to suspect something fishy, for the pensioners agreed that Berezovsky had removed Yeltsin, and about there being too many Tajiks, and about how back in the day there had been a real fraternity of peoples, and now it was just the Jews. They even agreed that Yevtushenko had been nominated for the Nobel solely because he condemned the Holocaust. Their conflict somewhat fractured Petrov's understanding of logic, so that he had begun to feel as though he too were going crazy, just like the two geezers, as he attempted to understand why they kept yelling at one another. This all seemed to be heading somewhere bad fast until the last stop was announced and the pensioners exited, walking slowly in opposite directions, as calm and removed from everything as before their argument. Nonetheless, having failed to resolve when life had been the sweetest, under Brezhnev or under Brezhnev. And so now, sick with the flu and feeling a kind of shift in his consciousness, Petrov, once again, stood undulating at the back of the trolley bus, gripping the top handrail. It wasn't crowded, but there were no seats available, and the driver kept cracking the same joke at every stop. Please stand clear of the non-closing doors. A little, a neat little Gramps got on at the Architecture Academy stop. He wore a clean gray coat and crisp gray trousers, and he carried a small suitcase with a buckle. He had a Lenin style, or maybe a Dzerzhinsky style, or perhaps a Lomonov style beard. His eyeglasses were whitened with frost, and he had just begun wiping them with the end of his red and black scarf when a girl of eight or so gave up her seat for him. Gramps thanked her and sat down. How old are you, he inquired, after allowing some time to pass. I'm nine, said the little girl, nervously adjusting her backpack with a thud. Did you know that an Indian of Afghanistan 
Girls as young as seven can get married. Petrov decided he must be delirious or that he was hearing things. He looked up at the old nutcase who continued to move his lips and produce sounds. So imagine, you'd have been married two years by now, the old man squinted slyly, fornicating with your husband for two years now, or maybe already cheating on him. Maybe already cheating on him. All you little bitches are the same, he concluded, patting her backpack with an avuncular smile and that same sly squint. The bus driver opened the non-closing doors. Gorkovo Street, he announced. The old man geared up to speak again, but at that very moment, a pale, skinny young man of about 17, he was sitting next to the old man on the same seat, came out of his stupor of observing the view through the scratched up window frost. He turned to the old man, took off the old man's glasses, and punched him right in the smacker, suddenly, but also rather mundanely, and not really all that hard. The old man's dentures slid towards Petrov's feet like a hockey puck. You little, the old man fumed. I served 15 in Angola for the likes of you. Please stand clear of the non-closing doors, announced the bus driver. Quickly, the young man grabbed the old man by the scarf and dragged him out through the doors like a disobedient dog. Petrov bent down and picked up the dentures from the trolley's wet corrugated rubber floor. He tossed the teeth through the window and onto the street, where the execution was now being carried out. The doors closed, and as the trolley bus peeled out, the little girl took the seat by the window as if nothing had happened. Petrov felt inexplicably apprehensive about sitting next to her, so he moved to the back window. It was almost clean, almost ice-free. There was an ad for RGS Insurance Group, which having been affixed on the other side of the glass appeared inverted, and so it obviously read as Porg Egnaruzny SGR. The ad also featured a bulldog for some reason, which could probably be seen more distinctly from the outside, but that looked rather pale from the inside, like the Hound of Baskerville, shrouded in fog. Through the same back window, Petrov also saw the police busting the young man and the grandpa, Gramps skillfully defending himself by whacking the cops with his suitcase and the cops fighting back with bats and fists. Maybe he really had been in Angola, thought Petrov rather indifferently, with the part of his brain that was most affected by the fever of influenza. As distance gradually obscured the carnage, Petrov began re-examining the Porg Egnaruzny SGR ad, pondering things like, do the Chinese have abbreviations or do their characters suffice? With each exhale, he could feel how hot, empty, and roomy his nasal cavity had become. He longed for cold, sparkling water, cigarettes, aspirin, more cold, sparkling water, and sleep. They used to consider these types of people blessed, came a schoolmarmish old lady voice from behind Petrov's back. They were respected, they were visited, and now look what we've come to. Hmm, thought Petrov indifferently. Nowadays, continued the voice, they can show whatever they want on TV, but they won't let a person speak. Petrov thought, not without amusement, how curious it would be if he turned around and saw a completely empty trolley bus while the voices droned on, but he chose not to turn. He started to watch the road, but the view of it rolling out from under the tail end of the trolley bus made Petrov feel nauseated. He lifted his eyes to watch the cars and noticed that there was a hearse right behind them. A fuchsia, gazelle brand hearse with two vertical black stripes across its face. The person in the passenger seat was happily waving his arms at Petrov. It wasn't his eyes, but rather Petrov's heated brain that slowly focused on the arm waver so that Petrov could finally connect the dots. This was his old buddy, and this buddy seemed to be indicating something like, why don't you join me? How unfortunate that Petrov hadn't dared to sit next to the little girl for the last time he saw this buddy of his, and the buddy's name is, was Igor, by the way. The last time things had concluded with both Igor and Petrov, three sheets to the wind, deciding to travel to the faraway town of Irbit. Thankfully, Igor began taunting passers-by on their way to the train station, and because this all coincided with paratrooper day, their trip was curtailed by fistfights and drunken revelry on the little islet by the Ural State Agricultural University, 
and with songs about blue berets and the company of tan, tatted out muscular dudes who had, as if simultaneously, stepped out into the city streets from the blue oyster bar. <laughs>